Good afternoon, everyone. Ready? <laughs> My name is Chungwan Wani Wu, uh, and I'm an associate uh, director of the IBS Center for Neuroscience Imaging Research at Song Kyunkwan University. I'm honored to co-chair this keynote session with Dr. Shinon Park, a postdoctoral fellow at the Child Mind Institute. We are thrilled to introduce our keynote speaker today, Dr. James McShine. Uh, Associate Professor McShine is a senior principal uh, research fellow at the University of Sydney, Australia. He attended his first OHBM conference in 2011 in Quebec City and has been a dedicated attendee ever since. So to provide a bit of his background, Dr. Shine uh, completed his bachelor's medical degree and PhD at the University of Sydney. Following this, he undertook a postdoctoral fellowship uh, with Ross Poldrack at Stanford University as an NHMRC CJ Martin Fellow. And Dr. Shine has published over 150 peer-reviewed research articles, which have been cited more than 11,000 times. His interdisciplinary team in Sydney is pioneering research to understand the mechanisms of flexible adaptive behavior through the integration of brain imaging, functional neuroanatomy, and computational modeling. So today he will share his insights on the neural basis of cognition to us. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Shine to the podium. Wow. Um, uh, this is a real privilege and a real honor. Um, I've been, as I uh, mentioned in the preamble, thank you very much, Wani. I've been coming to this meeting for a number of years and I think really grew up as a scientist in this really lovely community. Uh, and I'm really excited today to tell you about some of the work that we've been doing and put it in the context, uh, some of the ideas that are bubbling around the lab. All right, let's start back a little medical doctor, Mac doing a PhD uh, in Sydney and trying to tackle these problems for people that, uh, with Parkinson's disease that really affect their day-to-day -day life. And so Parkinson's disease is a really challenging issue because you've got these people that have these very diverse set of symptoms. We know a lot about the different types of symptoms, a lot of different clusters. We also know a lot about the pathology that affects the people with Parkinson's in their brain. We know that if you look on autopsy in an area of the substantia nigra pars compacta, and there's actually a loss of the dopaminergic cells that project into the basal ganglia. And then we can go and look in the literature at the different circuit level understanding of the basal ganglia. We can draw out our little wiring diagrams. The striatum projects to the globus pallidus, projects down to the internus, goes to the thalamus, back to the cortex. We can write out all these wiring diagrams. But then we go and put these individuals in a scanner. Let's say we get them to perform a cognitive dual task, something like you know, push a button and then you have to count backwards from seven from 100. And we get some kind of a brain map out. And as a person who'd been trained in medicine and then was learning how to perform functional neuroimaging, I found it just really difficult to figure out how you could link these things together. How can you take this circuit-based cellular level description of what might be the pathological basis of this different disorder and then link it to this really amazing, uh, non-invasive way of actually tapping into what's happening in the brain in real time in these people. So. Uh, let's imagine now, where you're back with me we're on, a, on our a plane in Australia, and I decide I'm going to go to a conference. For the sake of the argument, let's pretend it's SFN, so a nice big broad neuroscience conference, to, to look for answers for how these things connect together. So there I go, flying off on my plane. I'm over to SFN. I'm just one second here. I've noticed that there's no clock started, so I'll just click this right here. All right. So here I am in the, uh, the, the poster hall of SFN. I don't know if... Most of you have attended an SFN before. A poster hall at SFN is an absolutely ridiculous experience. It's just gigantic, and it's filled with people. Um, and so I'm, let's imagine I'm walking around this conference here. So I'm going to represent myself as a koala clutching a very, very large cup of coffee. Um, and I'm walking around the conference, and I'm trying to figure out how can I link these things together? How can I take the cellular level descriptions and computational descriptions and link them to neuroimaging and the clinical disorder? So here I go, walking around, and I go through all these different posters. And let's say I see good posters. I see posters in lots of different areas. A computational poster, I see a really good cognitive neuroscience poster, a really good clinical poster, maybe looking at subtypes of Parkinson's, and something about the systems level, some really cool snazzy new optogenetic technique, and some neuropixels recordings. And the problem is, when you really sit back and reflect on this, the kinds of methods 
the kinds of terminologies, the kind of papers that they cite in these different poses are completely different from one another. And yet they're studying the same thing putatively, this brain in the middle of it all. So let's make a little cartoon of this. Let's imagine now we've got these different posters with their little citation cards. So every dot here is now a, a, a different poster that I've been to. And then the little edges connecting them are something like the similarity of the different techniques or um, papers that they cited. So this is a cartoon. It's not meant to be data driven. I think we've got a real challenge on our hands here as neuroscientists, which is that our field at the moment is completely splintered. It's segregated. It's very, very difficult to have meaningful conversations across these different clusters. The kinds of techniques and tools they use are really fundamentally different. And I think this is actually a really big problem for us because there's so many crazy advances that are happening down at the cellular level and the circuit level in animal models. The techniques now in, in modern neuroscience are, are just phenomenal. I, I, we regularly are just blown away when we have people join the lab to give talks about these kinds of techniques, the kinds of control you can have, the selective ablation of cell types in a particular region that leave the whole rest of the brain completely alone are just amazing. And so are the kinds of things you can do when you put an individual patient with Parkinson's in the scanner and you map their brain with the high res recordings we're getting now and get them to do context specific tasks. So in both cases, we really need insights for both of these, but we can't connect them together. So I personally think that fMRI has a big role to play in this. I think one of the things that we can do with fMRI is we can actually link to each of these different domains on their own and then hopefully try to integrate across them. If we get insights from causal stimulation of the brain in an animal model, but also measure bold, we can then see whether that test that, test that hypothesis, whether that looks like the kind of measure we get when we look inside a person's brain. And in some ways, I'm preaching to the choir here. Right? OHBM, I think, has really led the way in terms of open science that's actually trying to make this job easier, to try to sort of connect the dots between these different fields. And I think in large part because of those open science principles. Because nowadays, you can, there's so much data being shared, there's so many different uh, code repositories, there's so many different uh, ideas out there that I think are really um, uh, amenable to scientific discourse that I think now is a really, really great time for us um, to capture that enthusiasm and excitement for connecting across these different areas. Um, I want to make a quick note as well that I personally have really, really benefited uh, and my group's really benefited from the open science of this community in the sense that we use a lot of open data and collaborate with people that share their data with us. And we really are appreciative of that fact and the fact that we could not collect that kind of data at that scale on our own. If we were doing that, we would spend our whole day just collecting data. But to be able to ask the kinds of questions we want to ask, I think we can only do that by standing on the shoulders of the giants of the community. I really want to, really want to underline that point. So I wanted to ask this question, you know, what can we do to close this gap? But the gap's probably a little bit more like this. Things are so far apart. Now, I don't have the golden bullet solution to this. And I think it's actually going to take a community of people with a lot of diverse different uh, opinions and ideas and backgrounds to actually make good progress on this front. But I want to tell you a little bit today about what we've been doing in my group and the kinds of um, projects we've been doing to try to help close this gap a little bit. And I think when you're looking for inspiration for how to build a research program, I think it's really informative to go back to the past. And a scientist who I deeply admire, Walter Freeman, um, had this really great quote. Our understanding of the brain is protected by two of God's own firewalls neurobiology and nonlinear dynamics. Now, I don't know how many of you know card-carrying neurobiologists or nonlinear dynamic uh, phys uh, physicists. They don't usually talk together. Um, these are not the kinds of fields that would normally be bedfellows. But I think when you combine these things together, you can ac actually get really, really deep insights about the function of the, of the nervous system. So what do I mean when I say nonlinear dynamics? So let's imagine here we've got just a typical human brain, so someone lying in a scanner, and we extract some time series from these data. What we would normally do with this is we would take the data and we'd perform some kind of summary statistics on the data. Maybe we correlate the different time series together, make a correlation matrix, build a network out of it, try to run some kind of statistic on that. The idea with nonlinear dynamics is to try to think more about what's generating those kinds of time series. Trying to think about the kinds of equations that could, uh, if you could mess with the different parameters, would tell you whether or not the time series would look this way or that. Now, in some ways, this is a really hard thing to measure directly from a time series because there's measurement noise and a number of other factors. But this concept is really important because it suggests that you can actually understand something about the process that generated the data in the first place. Now, in practice, from real data, it's really, really hard to infer this kind of stuff directly from data. People are making really great progress in, in a lot of different fields. One of the things that we find really helpful and intuitive uh, is this notion of thinking of what we call an attractor landscape. So here what you could do is you can imagine, let's say I uh, laid out all my data in a, in a time series, and I looked at a uh, configuration of all the different states that it could be in. So here what I mean by a state is, let's say I've got um, a parcellation scheme, or it could be all the voxels or vertices, whatever you choose. 
I'm going to call a configuration of that a state, and I'm going to lay them all out in this sort of um, imaginary two-dimensional landscape. The likelihood is that it's actually much more high-dimensional in, in real data. Uh, and the idea is that I could imagine then the topography of this landscape is going to tell me how stable or unstable the dynamics will be at any particular point in time. So um, you can quantify this as well. You can make a set of assumptions. Um, some really lovely work that uh, postdoc Brandon Munn in my group uh, pioneered was the, with this idea of essentially just uh, trying to track how unlikely or likely it was that a particular brain state would actually evolve into a, a common brain state or an uncommon brain state. So here we're kind of discarding whether or not the default mode network or the visual network or the subcortical system is active. We're just asking what are the statistics of this system and how it's evolving over time. And so essentially what you can do is you can lay out all, this, uh, all of the brain states. You can essentially learn if I move from soon uh, to, to the point where I am in, the, in this left corner further in time, um, how far uh, of, or, or how uh, close am I in that particular state space to that original starting point. And then I can ask how surprising or, or expected was it that I actually made that move. And so you can estimate this from data. It obviously really, really matters which type of data you train this on. Uh, and so there's lots of um, interesting questions and important things to ask. But the idea is that we can actually get to some of these interesting uh, physical systems perspectives from, directly from data. And then what you could do is you could imagine this little ball rolling around the landscape into sort of periods of stability and then going from an uncertain point into another period of stability. So it's just a framework that lets us sort of make contact with this, this, non, this idea of nonlinear dynamics. All right, what about the other uh, side of the coin, the neurobiologists that never talk to the physicists? Um, this is data from a really beautiful study called Microns, uh, and they, here they've taken a millimeter of the visual cortex in a mouse, and they've done a, a tracing of all the different cell types and, um, and blood vessels and such in this area. And it's just mind-blowingly complex. It's just absolutely packed with connections. All the cells look completely different. These are different subtypes of the cells. They have funny labels on them in their video that I would um, love to debate later. But um, these, are, these are layer two, three cells. They're the kind of, kind of main input, output uh, of the uh, supergranulase of the cerebral cortex. These are layer four cells, the main input of the uh, core thalamus. And then there would be some really beautiful, deep, pyramidal neurons that we like to think a lot about, uh, thick tufted pyramidal neurons in, in the end. But the point to make is that there's so much diversity down there that it's almost impossible to kind of see the forest for the trees. And one of the main ways that people have been going about this, and I think this is actually a really admirable research program, is to essentially take all of this complexity in a brain, like a mouse brain, and try to essentially see what complexity there is. How can we characterize this system and see what all the parts might be? So this is uh, a picture from uh, a really nice paper from the Allen Brain Institute, which was uh, essentially characterizing all the different cell types they could find in a mouse brain. And so on the left-hand side, you can see the plot, uh, the initial stain with all the different um, cell, cell types. Oh, sorry. Thank you. Is that better? Ah. Do I need to go back? From the beginning, oh shit. Um, Okay, uh, I'll give you a little preamble. Um, it's really, really cool if we can combine statistical physics and the complexity of neurobiology together. Um, for, uh, for the neural dynamics, we really want to be able to understand how the different, um, how we can infer the kinds of processes that come from the time series to understand how they can be generated. And in terms of neurobiology, I'm just in the middle of telling you how bloody hard it is to look at a brain and figure out what the parts are and why they matter. So. One of the things that people you'll find will often do when they're faced with this complexity is a really sensible thing. How can I cluster the data? What, what's a way that I could essentially ask the data to tell me in a data-driven fashion all the different parts? But I actually think that this, this way of going about things is actually really, really difficult to then extend to the ne that really next hard question, like what is the impact of this particular circuit? So what I'd like to argue is that we should be looking more for what we would call heuristic models of the brain. So I'm just going to, I've just got a little um, diagram here of a few of my favorite heuristic models from the last uh, few years of, in the literature. Um, one of my favorites is uh, some work from Marcel Messelum from back in 1998 when I was in year 10 in high school. Uh, and Marcel was, had a background in neurology and he was really interested in trying to track the difference between the kinds of neural systems that were connected either to the external world via the retina, the cochlea, the sensory system, and the kinds of systems that would actually control movements in the body. He could think of them as one end, and he could think of the other end as something controlling the valence of the system or the internal set point, like the hypothalamus. And he was imagining the connections between moving from a cognitive mode to a sensory mode of, of operation. So this is obviously an oversimplification. It's not talking about all the different cell types, but it gives you a framing in which you can think about the organization of the system. 
In the middle is a really beautiful paper from Randy McIntosh, which he calls Contexts and Catalysts. This was really informative for me early when I was thinking about networks, not just thinking about the configuration of a network, but what that configuration could buy the system in terms of information processing. So you can imagine that a system could actually set up so that if an input was to come into the network after that uh, first input had come in, it we could act in a different way, like a context. And in other ways, you might imagine a part of a network becoming active, which then let the system uh, communicate in a way that it couldn't beforehand by sort of promoting connections between regions. And then another uh, really lovely heuristic model of the brain that I really love uh, comes from Olaf Spawns, where he was thinking about these different kinds of extremes of organization of a network. So you can imagine if you've got a bunch of different nodes in the brain with some connections between them, you could then characterize whether or not they were separated into different modules or whether they were integrated into a whole. And so one of the things that I really like about these models is that it lets you sort of daydream how they might be connected together. You can try to think about ways to test hypotheses of their connection. So here's uh, Marcel Messalem's uh, framework of, from sensation to cognition sort of framed in a different way. So here you've got the visual network, the auditory network, the motor network, these different elements that are connected to the body or to the external world on one end, and then you've got what we call the prelimbic on the other end. Um, and uh, fortunately for us, uh, Marcel put out a bat signal uh, and contacted by Ghoulies man. And uh, we now have a really nice data-driven way to make contact with this, right? We can take data, we can perform sets of dimensionality reduction on the data, and we can come up with an empirical estimate of what this gradients would be around the brain. Um, so the question is, how can we link that with the kinds of concepts that we saw in Randy's Context and Catalyst and, and Olaf's uh, integration segregation? And so what we can do is we can take nodes of the, of the brain, let's say we come up with different parcels, they can now form a network. So every single node is now a brain region, and then the connections between them uh, will be defined by some kind of statistical similarity between the regions. And so we can now then map the different colors from the brain on the right into this little network. And some of the work that I did in my postdoc uh, was to essentially try to take this concept of thinking of different modules in the brain and different uh, network properties and link them to performance of cognitive tasks. So if you, to cut a very long story short, if you essentially look at the way that the brain reconfigures and the different parts of the brain that play this really crucial role in cognitive tasks, a lot of them overlap in the areas that are actually sitting between these specialist networks. So we'd call these participation hubs, or others have called them the diverse club. And the idea is that they're sitting in this really privileged position to allow intercommunication between regions. You can then imagine that they would play the role of sort of being a context or a catalyst in the way that uh, Randy was conceptualizing. So in other words, we can kind of connect across these different concepts in ways that I think are really informative. But there's a problem inherent with this approach, which is that we're really, when we're asking these questions, just thinking about the cerebral cortex, this thin outer layer of the brain, which is really nice and prominent and lumpy in humans, very obvious to look at, a little bit easier to scan when we have the particular coils set up the way that we do um, in, our, in our scanners. But if you go and look in the literature for um, different sensory, cognitive, and motor functions, you actually find really compelling evidence that the cortex is actually not working on its own. In fact, the subcortical systems are actually playing often really crucial roles in these different phenomena. So for the case of the sensory system, it's fairly uncontroversial to say that something like visual perception involves a light beam hitting the, ret hitting the retina, passing on a little projection to the lateral geniculate nucleus onto V1. There might, might be some projections back and forth in the um, temporal lobes or the parietal lobes. But many of you might not know that if you went in and put musamol, a GABAergic agonist, into the superior colliculus of a macaque, which is what Rick, Rick Clausus and colleagues did a number of years ago, you actually render that macaque functionally blind. Uh, in its contralateral hemisphere. So it now can't see anything in the other side of the world, despite the fact that you could not tell the difference in the electrophysiological signature measured from its parietal and temporal cortex. So this suggests that the colliculus is actually playing this sort of crucial gating role in this visual perceptual ability. So here uh, in, the, in the motor system, here's um, a couple rats performing this little um, complex sequence task to get, a, to get a reward. And the thing that's really interesting about these rats is that the one on the right has had his motor cortex removed. So here, this motor, I, I think I would challenge you, except for the little sort of buzz cut that the, the rat on the right has received, it's really hard to tell the difference between the, their movements. And this suggests that the motor cortex, while important for many different things, may not, at least in the case of this rat, be important for his execution of this particular sequence. So that's for sensory and motor. What about something more challenging like a cognitive task? Well, for something like working memory, the ability to hold an item over a delay, um, a group, Nua Lee's group, uh, was actually able to show that if you go in and have an, an animal trained to perform a task, this is, in this case is a mouse, 
they get a queue, they have to wait over a delay, and then lick to the appropriate um, side, uh, left or the right, to receive their reward. If you go in and you optogenetically turn off the output of the deep cerebellar nuclei, which then project up to via the thalamus into the cortex, this animal is unable to perform this working memory task. So in other words, here we have a cerebellar system that's involved heavily in working memory, which I think would be undeniably considered a cognitive function by almost anyone in this audience. So I think this is really challenging for us. I think we now need to kind of question to ourselves, what kinds of answers are we looking for? And I think we really need to understand the impact of the subcortex on the nonlinear dynamics of the system. So for the rest of my talk today, I'm going to highlight a couple of the projects that we're working on to this end. Uh, some of them focus on an area of the thalamus, which is uh, one of my first loves in neurobiology, and uh, the other is going to focus on an arm of the ascending arousal system, the locus cerealis. All right, so the thalamus, um, you often find uh, people carving the thalamus up into different, different groups. It's this kind of little clump of structure. It looks like two little eggs deep to the cerebral cortex, and it's really, really heavily interconnected with both the cerebral cortex and a lot of other regions in the subcortex and the brainstem. And you'll often find it kind of parcelated up into these different little subnuclei. Don't worry about the names right now, but the idea is that different regions project to different parts of the cerebral cortex. But it actually turns out if you go down even one layer further and look at the little cells that are inside each of those different nuclei, there's a massive diversity of different cell types. On the one extreme, we've got cells that look a little bit like the ones from the retina to the LGN to V1 that project really, really, really precisely into the granular layers of the cerebral cortex. But if we go to the other extreme, there's weird and wonderful cells that come up and split their axons and go to multiple different regions and project in, in wildly different ways. In fact, it's really, really hard to characterize um, these different cell types in a way that fits with the nuclear divisions. Uh, and so people have tried this um, uh, for, in many different ways and, and I think really insightful ways in the past, looking, for example, at whether or not a thalamic cell receives a particular layer of cortical output to that cell. You can classify things that way. You could imagine classifying according to whether or not that cell receives inputs from a different type of a structure, let's say the basal ganglia or the cerebellum or the retina. You can or you could take something like gene products. And so here on the right, I'm showing you the kind of relative expression, just in cartoon form, of some of these different ways of carving up the thalamus. And I think it should be pretty clear to you that they're not all coinciding with one another. The dark spots on one are not really perfectly aligned with the other. And so this actually raises a really difficult challenge. How on, uh, are we supposed to kind of jump into this system and actually make any kind of progress understanding how it functions, how it works? Well, many years ago, um, back in uh, the late 80s, early 90s, Ted Jones, uh, a, a New Zealand anatomist, actually had a really lovely insight, which is that if you looked at the three different um, parcellation schemes on the, on the bottom row, so whether or not they were targeted or diffuse projections from the different thalamic nuclei, whether they projected to layer four of the, or layer one of the cerebral cortex, and whether they expressed a calcium binding protein, parvalbumin or calbindin, they actually align with each other pretty, pretty nicely. Not perfectly, but enough that you could start to imagine that this might be an interesting organizing principle. So Eli Muller, a really talented postdoc in my lab, was really interested in trying to test uh, whether or not this organizing principle might relate to different things that we can see in neuroimaging data. So he, he took advantage of the fact that parvalbumin and calbindin both have unique gene products, and he essentially uh, extracted the regional expression of these different um, uh, gene products, so it's um, p-valb and, and calb1 in both cases from the Allen Human Brain Atlas. He then uh, took the time series from those uh, thalamic parcellations and regressed them against the cerebral cortex. And then he could, um, he could then essentially uh, characterize each of the different uh, cortical regions according to whether or not they were more or less correlated uh, with either of these two different populations. And so if you look on the left, you see in the core system, we see really strong positive correlations with sensory regions like V1, S1, and A1. When we look in the calbinin situation, uh, uh, correlations, they look much more like the default mode network but they also look a little bit like the primary gradient. Um, so we're really excited by this, right? Because the primary gradient is this really interesting organizing principle. Here's this heuristic level understanding of the system that we can all measure from our data, and we could find access to it from the subcortical organizing principle that we think is really, really, really important for the way that this system functions. So Eli, having a background in physics, was actually really interested in trying to tie this to nonlinear dynamics. Um, and so he was uh, part of a collaboration with uh, Steve and Bing Brunton at the University of Washington and using some uh, really beautiful 7T resting state data set that was donated to us by Luca Kochi and Luke Hearn from the University of Queensland. Um, Eli went about trying to characterize some of these really interesting nonlinear dynamics. And so in this case, he was inspired by this notion of the fact that different types of fluid can flow in different ways. Steve Brunton is, uh, is, an, is a world expert in the way that fluid dynamics 
uh, flow, and we were interested in whether we could use some of the algorithms that they use to quantify these kinds of patterns in brain imaging data. So um, Eli took a time series from this resting state data set, parcelated it up, looked at it over time, but he needed a way to essentially track whether or not the flow was, was particularly laminar, like a smooth flow down a river, or non-laminar, something like a turbulent set of rapids. And so the way he went about that is he calculated an update matrix A from the data, and then he went through it every single time point and asked, how far forward into the future can I predict well what the particular next pattern will be? And he quantified that uh, for each different step up to about 10 delays at each point. And what that lets us do is make something we call horizon plot. So here now time is on the x-axis, on the y-axis uh, is the number of lags, and then on that z-axis moving up and down is how much error we had at those different delays. And one of the really interesting things that jumped out to us right at the start is that there's a real kind of non-linear uh, flow here. There are periods of time when the brain looks relatively stable, and there are periods of time when it looks relatively unstable and very difficult to predict from the update matrix. So you can compare that to different types of nulls. So if we just shuffle the data and scramble it, you'd expect that some of that linearity would go away, and that's, that's definitely the case. But interestingly, if we, can, if we take a, the covariance of the actual data and the spectral content, but imbue that onto a white, uh, white noise background, you actually don't have this preserved laminarity either, which suggests that there might be something in the actual data that's conserving this laminar structure over time. So what Eli was really interested in challenging, the, uh, challenging himself to do, though, was to actually recreate some um, important effects that people had seen in the literature. So there was a really beautiful paper that came out from Yuri Solman's group at the University of Wisconsin, uh, where they actually took a macaque monkey, gave it propofol, uh, which an anesthetized the monkey, and then they went in with an electrical stimulator, 50 hertz stimulation, into the central lateral thalamus, which is a really matrix-rich thalamic nuclei, and they're actually able to wake the animals up from anesthesia. So we were really interested, could we recreate these same kinds of effects? Um, but again, we turned to the past and looked for some wise words from our scientific leaders. And here, Eve Marder, who's uh, one of my academic heroes, said, because the output of all biological circuits results from the interaction of many nonlinear elements, computational models are needed to understand them. I think this is a really, really wise statement. Anytime you have many different variables interacting with one another, you can't keep them all in your mind at the same time. So put them down into equations and see whether or not your intuitions are actually le lend, lend themselves to those different types of models. So Eli built one of uh, a little corticothalamic neural mass model. So it was inspired um, and built on the backbone of a really uh, lovely, well-validated um, well neural mass model created by Peter Robinson, which was meant to mimic features of the corticothalamic system. Um, bless his heart, Peter wasn't really as much of a thalamic nerd as I am, so he wasn't really as interested in the matrix thalamus. So when he built this model, he was thinking more about that core thalamic population. So if you look on the left-hand side, the E and the I represent different cortical populations. Uh, the SC re represents uh, the core thalamic nuclei projecting back up in a relatively selective fashion to the, to the, um, to the cortex. But what Eli was interested in doing was imbuing this extra thalamic population, these matrix cells, which pr diffusely project out to the rest of the nervous system uh, and essentially contact multiple different regions at once. He then mimicked uh, some simple cortico-cortical connectivity using an, an exponential drop-off. Uh, but importantly, he constrained the kind of connectivity he saw and the balance between these different core and matrix populations based on that empirical result that we'd recovered from comparing the calbine and the parvalbumin staining uh, to the brain. So he was able to build this model, and then we got to basically test it. We got to see whether or not it could recreate the same kind of features that we saw, uh, or that Yuri and colleagues saw in their, in their experiment. So, the first challenge was essentially to see whether or not we could recover the kind of things that you see when you give an, uh, an animal propofol. So propofol is a GABAergic, uh, GABA uh, GABA-A agonist, so it basically turns up the inhibition in the system, and it makes it much harder um, for the, the system to actually deviate from that laminarity. So this is, this is a really interesting result in its own right. So if you anesthetize this uh, uh, um, a macaque, actually in this case, this is actually human imaging data. If you anesthetize um, a person, you actually see an increase in the laminarity of their bold signal. So it's actually much easier to predict what will come next when you're anesthetized. But when you wake up, you start to see those deviations again in the horizon plot. So this is a really interesting, uh, re interesting result in its own right. If I then show you uh, the amount of that um, predictability uh, in these two different, um, these two different uh, da data sets, in the awake and the propofol, you can actually see that the propofol is uh, more predictable than the awake brain. And so the question was, if Eli went into his model, gave every single one of the E populations just a little bit more um, inhibition from the, the GABA um, A agonist, which he can tune in his model directly, 
he can recapitulate uh, a phenomenally similar result, which is, I think, a, a really nice uh, kind of sanity test. But the real challenge is whether or not he can recreate the effects of the stimulation of the matrix salamis. So here we have, again, in the model, we have the propofolized in blue and the wake in black. And when Eli took his model and he injected a boxcar current to the matrix salamis uh, in, in his model, he essentially saw a shift towards that awake state. And so that's what we see in the macaque LFP. So I'm really excited by this. Here we've got this complicated, anatomically inspired model that can recapitulate the signatures that we see from a really interesting and challenging ex uh, experimental observation of stimulating the thalamus to actually arouse a macaque monkey from anesthesia. But the benefit of models doesn't stop there. In fact, if you stop there, I think you're kind of missing the point of the model. The thing about models that is so much fun is that you can then turn back around and ask them, why did this happen? Why is it that it worked? And one of the really insightful ways that Eli has actually analyzed his model that I think it makes this uh, result really intuitive is that he imagines what would happen, or he actually follows what would happen, when he stimulates different parts of the cortex that are either connected preferentially to the matrix populations or the core populations. So on the left-hand side, this is imagined stimulating the frontal eye fields, which then come down into the uh, matrix-rich population. And what that ends up doing is essentially having the matrix connections come back up and prime the system so that the next little uh, cortico-cortical connection can have that much more likely, be that much more likely to project onto the, to the next time point. In contrast, for the core uh, re um, he heavy regions here um, now in the, in the sensory cortex, you actually see that when you stimulate that region, because it's going down to the thalamus and just hitting a targeted reciprocal connection, you essentially don't see that parallel wave. And so you can, you can show this uh, by kind of or um, orienting the, um, the data, showing you at, at the time to peak that a much ma um, many, many more regions are actually becoming more active in a shorter time window and in parallel in the case when you stimulate a region that is um, projecting to the matrix thalamus than to the core thalamus. So I think this is a really, really exciting idea, right? You can like, take these concepts from models and understand this really, really otherwise irreducibly complex system using really, really um, simple analogies. All right, changing gear to the ascending arousal system. So I've, I've tried to convince you so far that thinking about neurobiology and constraining neuroanatomical models and thinking about the kinds of dynamics that can come from them is really helpful. And I think this is the same and, and probably even more so for the, for the ascending arousal system. So the locus surrealis is not alone. Um, there are many different regions in the ascending arousal system uh, that spread all the way down from the brainstem up into the forebrain. Um, they're characterized by the, set, uh, by the fact that they have a really different type of an impact on the cells that they target. So here's a little cartoon of a presynaptic and a postsynaptic glutamatergic neuron. You can imagine now a little action potential coming down, fusing with a uh, vesicle, uh, releasing uh, glutamate across the synapse. It then hits one of the different ion channels, which then passes on an action potential to the postsynaptic potential. The neuromodulatory system works in a slightly different way. Rather than contacting ion channels directly, even though they do uh, affect some ion channels, they typically contact what we would call G-protein coupled receptors. So these are uh, transmembrane, re transmembrane receptors which actually contain uh, an internal um, second messenger cascade that when that receptor is activated, it actually causes a conformational change. There's then a cascade inside the cell which then causes either the release of calcium, which can change the excitability of the cell, or it can actually cause different uh, ion channels to open and close in, in ways that change the excitability of the, of the target cell. So rather than thinking about this as a kind of message being passed from A to B to C, or a billiard ball that's hitting another billiard ball that hits another billiard ball, it's better to think about this in the term in the, as more of like a catalyst in the way that Randy McIntosh um, was, was suggesting back in the day. We can think about it as changing the excitability of the cell, or another way to think about this is to change the gain of the system. So the gain of the system is really just the, um, the, uh, taking a differenti um, differentiating the firing rate curve, so the amount of current that you need to put into an individual neuron to get some firing, uh, firing rate Q out of that neuron. And if you take the first derivative of that, of that plot, you then have this little plot down the bottom, which looks a little bit like a Gaussian, a little discontinuity in it. And you can imagine that this is kind of the amount of bang you get for your buck. If I could put a little bit of noradrenaline into the system, I can move you around this curve and make it much more likely that the next message that comes in will be propagated or not. And so a challenge here is that the brain is actually inherently multi-scale. I think this is you know, one of these trivialities that we kind of all know in our heart of hearts, but it's very hard to kind of make contact with. And what we wanted to do is, is take these concepts that are down at the micro scale, but actually build them up to the macro scale in a way that's actually principled. 
So one of the ways that you can do this is make possibly the simplest assumption you can, which I think we all also know is maybe uh, not the best assumption to make sometimes, given the amount of connectivity down at the micro scale. But it's still a good assumption uh, nonetheless, because it lets us make contact with these different scales, which is namely that all the different cells are relatively independent from one another. In other words, we use the central limit theorem. And so what you can then do is take this single neuron response curve, and you multiply it by a Gaussian, just assuming that all the neurons are independent, and then you can recover what's called a population response curve. So this takes the form of a simple sigmoid, and the slope of that sigmoid is now telling us the gain of the population. So importantly, sigmoids are really uh, tractable, and they're the kinds of things that we can bake into the models that we use to actually understand population level activity. So while we've had to make assumptions, now we can actually cross across these scales and say interesting things and, and test interesting hypotheses about how the system might work. So there are numerous ways in which uh, neural gain can be, uh, be, be affected by neuromodulators. I'm not going to cover all of those today, but just to pick a couple, you can imagine on the left-hand side that changing the excitability of the cell would make it such that an uh, excitatory postsynaptic potential in blue or an inhibitory postsynaptic potential in red are actually more extreme. You can imagine the amplitude of that system changing as I change the neuromodulatory tone of a system. And we could also imagine changing the slope of the transfer function. Here I've got my population of neurons, I've put in a bit of noradrenaline, now it's much more excitable, a little bit less excitable, depending on what I've put in. So then what you can do is you can take these different parameters, which are now assumptions about how the system would work in the context of these different neurochemicals, and you can actually plot them out into a, into a uh, parameter space and then use a model. And so in this case, we were using a virtual brain model. We use a Fitsunagumo model from that package, uh, working in, in collaboration with Michael Brakespear and, and Russ Poldrack. And what we wanted to do was understand what happens if we sweep these different parameters and then look at emergent properties of the system. So in this case, I was really, really interested in trying to figure out whether or not we could recreate those changes that we saw in the participation coefficient, that variable that sits between the different modules of the, of the brain, of the, of the cortex, and acts as a little bit like the sort of intercommunicator between the different networks. And it turned out that as we changed these two different parameters, not only did we see some changes that conformed to our predictions, but also many more. And I'm still kind of flabbergasted by just how much uh, nonlinear heterogeneity comes out from this really, really simple model with just a few different um, structural connections that are different between the different regions and these very, very simple parameters. And I think the idea is that the, uh, that's really important to kind of intuit is that little changes and little differences really stack up in these nonlinear systems. So you don't need a huge impact to have a really, really big um, uh, um, benefit in the long run. So Brandon Munn, uh, re a really, really talented postdoc in my lab, who's actually at his first HBM uh, this year, uh, was really interested in trying to take this another step further. And Brandon was inspired by a really, another really beautiful idea in physics known as the renormalization group, which is that if you want to try to make some of these inferences across scales, let's say you really cared about how different water molecules could combine together to form a wave, one of the simplest things you can do is you can sort of stack up the smaller pieces into bigger and bigger blocks in some principled way, and then look across all the different scales and see how the system looks. So in this case, what we do is we take regional time series from uh, just from resting state, and we look at the correlations between each of the different pairs of, of regions. We then greedily cluster them according to whether or not they have the strongest pair. We then remove them from the set. Um, we actually uh, summarize them at the next level, and then we go and do that again and again and again. Now, this is a little bit like hierarchical agglomerative clustering, but we're actually going to enforce that you can only have one pair per level. And I'll explain the reason for that in the next slide. So we can obviously do this again and again and again, receiving new and newer and newer summary uh, variables that are essentially representative time series of the stacked regions below them to essentially get a time, uh, time series for each of the different levels of organization of the system from the, the scale that we set of the parcellation all the way up to the n of 1 of the whole brain. So the reason that we stack across the scales and enforce that stacking um, is that we can then look at different kinds of summary statistics of the, of the system across those different scales and ask how they stack together. So if we were, let's say we clustered in one particular level and we let all the clusters happen in that level, we wouldn't be, we wouldn't be, uh, be then able to tell you whether the variability of that level had really anything to do with the variability of a higher level. But by stacking with each of the levels, we can actually then track that across scales. And, um, one thing I've learned by working with, with physicists is that they deeply, deeply love straight lines, um, particularly on log-log plots. Um, one of the reasons for this is that they actually evidence for something called universality, so the kinds of ways that a system is organized. 
So um, on the left here, I'm showing you just kind of a little cartoon. You can imagine that if a system was completely independent, if every single region in your parcellation had nothing to do with any of the others, if I started to stack them up, I'm going to cancel out all of the different wiggles that they have in their time series, and the system will scale at a value of one in this log log plot. In contrast, if I tried to fool you and I gave you a, time, a set of time series, all of which were absolutely identical to one another, all of the different wiggles would constructively interfere with one another, and I would essentially see the variance scale as a function of two. The really interesting stuff happens between those different scales, when you've got a little bit of independence and a little bit of, of coordination. And you can also say something about whether or not there's a privilege scale, if you see a kink in the time series. So looking across rest and task, this time from the Human Connectome project, you actually see really lovely evidence for robust uh, multi-scale scaling. So this suggests that the system is not completely independent and not completely low dimensional. It's sitting somewhere in between. And importantly, there's really no strong evidence for a kink in the system as well. There's no privileged scale at which we should be looking at these time series. There's interesting information across all of the different scales. So you can um, test that for yourself by calculating the derivative of this line across all the different scales, and it's a completely flat line in both cases. But what I was really interested in was not whether or not this system necessarily scaled in a particular way or another, but what I really wanted to know was if they're scaling in the, the same way, but I know that the correlations between these different structures uh, are, are different, that the task brain looks a little bit different to the rest brain. Where are those reconfigurations happening? When can I tell the difference between a, a configuration that's in the resting state and a configuration that's in the task state? So what we did there was we looked at all the pairings in rest, and then we asked if we looked in the task data, how commonly would we see a reconfiguration at each of these different scales? And so you can create a little um, a null, null um, a cutoff by taking the resting state data, the first half and the second half, and asking how often do I see the pairings change and go to some extreme level, the 99th percentile of some, of some null. And if we plot the, the task data, we see really substantial reconfigurations that are above that really extreme null, particularly in the mesoscales of the system. Precisely the parts of the brain, or part of the systems of the brain where we're actually really not looking. We often look at a whole brain level or down at a region level. But here's this massive reconfiguration happening in the mesoscale. And so if I plot that on a brain, uh, we see this really nice distributed um, frontoparietal networks and temporal lobe regions as well. But for those with a keen eye, these are actually really nicely overlapping with those same participation nodes that we noticed when we were uh, having, playing around with the idea of heuristic models at the start. So you can calculate the participation coefficient on the resting brain, you can calculate uh, just a linear correlation between those, and you see a really lovely positive correlation between these spatially, suggesting that there's something about the areas that reconfigure actually sitting in those positions in a network where they can actually do the maximal damage to the different connections that would occur between the different uh, specialist modules. But that's not what I started talking about. I wanted to talk to you about this ascending arousal system. So what role could the ascending arousal system play in this system? in this reconfiguration that we think is tapping into these participation hubs. So relatively fortunately, we've, we've had a really lovely collaboration with Valerio Zerbi, uh, who's now at the University of Geneva in Switzerland. And Valerio has a, a really lovely model in a rat where he actually uh, has a, a, a tyrosine hydroxylase positive Cre line of these rats, which means that they have an optogenetic uh, um, susceptibility just in the locus cerealis, just in the noradrenergic cells in the locus cerealis. So we can stick a little fiber in, turn a light on, and that turns those cells on and off when, it, when he chooses. He lightly anesthetizes these rats, puts them into uh, a uh, MR scanner, and calculates bold. And so we can essentially then go in and stimulate and turn on the locus cerealis and turn it off, and we can see whether or not we get the same reconfiguration. So here I'm stacking regions in the rat brain, stacking it up to the level of the systems. And if we look, here's our, our null cutoff, and we see evidence for the same kind of a thing. Mesoscale reconfiguration, pre versus post stimulation in a rat brain when you turn on and off the locus realis. So the, neurobiolis, neuro, the neurobiologist in me is just deeply, deeply excited by these ideas, that we can take causal stimulation of the nervous system, but then test the kinds of things that we can test in humans in the scanner when they're performing all measures of different cognitive tasks. Um, for those that are interested as well, you can also see a really nice flattening of that attractor landscape idea that I mentioned before as well. Uh, so yeah, this is uh, Brandon being his little reconfiguration wizard. Um, we don't want to stop there, though, because the, as I mentioned before, the ascending arousal system uh, is actually multi, um, multifaceted. So one of the main axes that we've thought a lot about is the difference between the uh, cholinergic system on the left and the noradrenergic system on the right. So I've been talking to you about this noradrenergic system and this idea of integrating a brain and flattening a landscape. 
But the cholinergic system is actually organized in a really different way. It has really targeted projections, and it actually really selectively activates subregions uh, of the cerebral cortex. So you could think about this as sort of uh, the locus cerebral is helping to flatten the landscape, and the cholinergic system helping to stabilize the landscape. Um, so we were actually able to um, uh, 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 conduct another collaboration, in this, in this case with Katie Chang uh, and David Leopold and others, where they had a really, really lovely data set, one of our favorite papers from the last 10 years, um, where they took a macaque monkey, they uh, injected musamol, a GABAergic agonist, into the basal nucleus of Maynard, this main cholinergic hub in these macaque monkeys, and then um, uh, calculated uh, bold data from, from those same monkeys. And our prediction was that if you uh, uh, looked at the points after the simulation versus a sham, we should see a relative flattening of the landscape because we've now inhibited the ability for the cholinergic system to function. And lo and behold, uh, we find really lovely evidence for that too. So I think this is just pointing towards uh, some really, really interesting inroads that we can make between the neurobiology of the brain and the kinds of nonlinear dynamics that it can support. So we started out with me sort of controversially uh, pointing out that the cerebral cortex maybe gets a little bit too much credit when it comes to thinking about how things like motor and sensory and cognitive systems work. But I think another way to think about it is that it really benefits from having a thalamus to help it. And the thalamus itself really benefits from having something like the basal ganglia and the cerebellum to help coordinate it and give it different kinds of cues as to when to become active or not. And they're all receiving inputs from the ascending arousal system, which can change the excitability and allow different forms of coalitions to occur in different contexts. But when you look at this graph for a little while, you start to wonder, maybe we've got it upside down. Maybe what we should be doing is thinking about the really evolutionary ancient systems in the brainstem and the kinds of constraints that they impose on other circuits and then thinking about the elaborations that come from that that can still form the benefits for adaptive behavior. So returning to our original problem, this disconnected network, these cellular level details and microcircuit properties and whether or not we can connect them to imaging to help solve problems from the bench to the bedside. So you know, how much progress do you think we've really made? I mean, I'd, maybe kind of that much, right? We're kind of like moving things in a little bit, but there's still this gigantic gulf. But what I think is really exciting about coming to meetings like this is that there are people around that are doing all these kinds of techniques so we can work on them together. So I've tried, tried to talk to you today about some of the biophysical models that we've used that have been inspired by neuroanatomical detail, combining them with whole brain imaging, giving us ways and insights into actually testing some of these hypotheses. Using causal imaging is actually a really, really crucial way to actually causally test the hypotheses we have rather than just describing the data that we see in front of us. I think improved recordings will help this a ton and I, we're actually really excited to see what comes out in the next few years. But really the open science practices and the sharing of data are just so crucially important. We often have our heads in the clouds thinking about ideas, neurobiology and physics. Being able to lean, uh, lean on these really amazing data sets is super helpful for, for my group and the people that will do the work that we do. Uh, and, you know, I didn't make any contact with it today, but I really think dense sampling and, and things like really taking seriously this notion of cognitive ontologies is going to be really important for us making progress here as well. But importantly, this is what HBM does. And so I'm excited to see what the next generation of OHBM scientists in the audience are going to do with all of these cool new techniques and tools we have and interesting questions. If you're interested in neurobiology and neurodynamics, please reach out. We're really happy to chat. Um, and with that, I'd like to say thank you very much. Uh, and of highlighted the people in yellow that did the bulk of the work. Thank you. Thank you so much for a beautiful talk. Uh, because of the time constraint, we, will only, we won't be able to ask all the questions that are uploaded in the system, but only the top two. So the first question is, how translatable are the post-cortex removal network findings in animals to humans? Perhaps differences in brain or cognitive capacity allow cortical specialization in humans? Yeah, this is a great question and one that I would love a uh, concrete answer to. Um, I think when you talk to people that do comparative neuroanatomy, it's actually really difficult to take the brain of a mouse or a macaque and compare it directly to a human and to know whether or not the functional circuits and the way that they actually characterize in the different species are actually performing similar roles. But what I really am excited to see is whether or not we can actually test these hypotheses causally. So let's go out there, collect the data, let's go use the benefits of animal modeling to turn on and off circuits, actually get deep invasive recordings, but then go and compare those to the kinds of problems that we see uh, when we put humans into the scanner. And the second question, what is an advantage of fMRI 
as a method to evaluate anatomy uh, inspired computational model compared to electrophysiology? Oh, I think they um, both have their place, and in, I wouldn't even limit it to that. I think that any type of measurement that we can take of this system, particularly when it's constrained by the kinds of models that we create and the explicit assumptions they have, and if we have causal perturbation, they're all going to um, add to a diversity of insights. Um, in, in the um, talk that I just mentioned, we had electrophysiology as well as BOLD. We also work with people that do calcium imaging, neuropixels recordings, and we really don't think that any one of these particular modalities is going to be the modality that kind of exposes the workings of the brain. They're rather just different ways in which to look at the system to give you different insights and test different hypotheses. Thank you again uh, for great research and great talk. Please give a big hands to Dr. McChang. Okay, let's close the session. Thank you for being here, everyone.